Good evening, everyone. I'm Gabriel Meyer, the Executive Director of the Ruskin Art Club of Los Angeles. Um, for those of you who uh, are new tonight, uh, it, this, tonight is a departure from our normal uh, programming, a guided study rather than a lecture per se, um, an introduction to Ruskin's first masterwork, Modern Painters, published in 1843 by a 24-year-old year old uh, Ruskin, identified, for at least for this first volume, only as a graduate of Oxford. The work initially written in defense of Ruskin's artistic idol, J.M.W. Turner, eventually ran to five volumes, written over a period of 17 years, from 1843 to 1860, and for many of us, constitutes the kind of uh, signal uh, uh, the record really of Ruskin's evolution uh, as a thinker. Professor Sarah Atwood will take us interactively through a bookended introduction uh, tonight to the final volume of the series, uh, Modern Painters 5. So we've kind of bookended this. Last week was Modern Painters 1, kind of get our feet wet, and then now to the, the final volume of the series. Um, We'll be reading selected excerpts from volume five uh, with open discussion, not only at the end, which would be our, our normal practice, but after each excerpt so that there can be a little more uh, interaction about the text. Uh, as I mentioned last week, we decided to do this last year um, to make this study dimension something that, uh, that we do at least once a year, that is to do a group uh, consideration and dialogue on the major work of Ruskin together. Uh, a couple of preliminaries. Um, I hope uh, everyone's had a chance to go to our website and take a look at the excerpts uh, for tonight. That will go a long way towards making these discussions fruitful. Uh, also, I would note there that we've added uh, uh, another essay uh, to the um, to the supplementary reading. Uh, last week, we added uh, Sarah's essay, Ideas of Imitation, Ruskin, Plato, and Aesthetics. And this time, we've added another essay of Sarah's on the Earth Veil, which deals with the, uh, with the, uh, the topic uh, that we're considering tonight. Uh, because of the interactive factor, we're doing something differently with regard to muting. Normally, we mute everyone at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, what I'm going to ask each of you to do is to mute yourselves when Sarah sp starts speaking and then unmute when you wish to speak during the various times for discussion. And I think this will make, make our exchanges a little freer. Sarah Atwood teaches English and writing at Portland State University and Portland Community College. She is a board member of the Ruskin Art Club and co-director with Jim Spates of the Ruskin Society of North America. Sarah has lectured widely both in the US and abroad on John Ruskin, education, the environment and language. She is also a companion of the Guild of St. George. Sarah. Okay. Thank you, Gabriel. And welcome everyone. I see some of you were here last week and there's a few new faces too, so I'm glad you've been able to join us. Uh, as Gabriel said, we're taking a big leap here, going from the first volume to the fifth, kind of not, not having time to cover the in-between, but I thought it would be a good idea since you know we have limited time in these reading sessions to talk about such a, an extensive work, um, to get a taste of the early volume, volumes and the late volumes. Um, it would be great to be able to work our way slowly through all of them, but we'll do what we can in the time that we have. Um, and volume five is published in 1860. And I mentioned in last week that, you know, although people tend to, some people tend to think of Ruskin as becoming much more involved in social criticism at this period, and he did, he, he foregrounds it more. It was there all along, even in the early work. And it's something that he draws out in his later work, not that he suddenly, you know, becomes aware of. Um, so volume five is much more concerned, you know, with questions of social criticism. He's also more concerned, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to um, focus on the Earth Veil tonight. He's also foregrounding his concern for the environment. 
Um, and the talk that Gabriel mentioned, the, the essay that's been that's been posted of mine is about Ruskin and environment. Um, I think that especially today, as we're you know coping and struggling with so many environmental questions and debates, um, it can be in, helpful and productive to turn back to Ruskin and see what it was that he was saying 150 years ago. A little distressing to realize that he was saying some of the things that we're still talking about today that long ago. Um, but I think that you know we can learn from him um, in reading his work of this period, especially. And so the Earth Veil passage um, has a lot to do with his concern with environment, but you know also the law of help, which I chose for tonight as well, says a lot about his thinking on cooperation and on community, um, on social values, on the values he thought were lacking at the time, um, and what he felt was important um, to build strong communities going forward. So the later volume here, volume five, the other thing that I find really compelling and fascinating about it is the way that he uses images in the volume. Um, we're not gonna be able to look at so much of that tonight, um, but in the volume one, I mentioned there's not you know, plates and images. By the time we get to the later volumes and certainly to volume five, you know, there's a lot of um, plates and illustrations and images and almost a um, composite volume in that sense. You know, The illustrations and the images reinforce the message of the text and they work together in that way. Um, and so I like the way that Ruskin uses um, those uh, the, the images to underscore what it is that he's saying and to make us think in a different way. Um, I'd like to start by reading from the Earth Veil vale, and this reading wasn't scheduled for tonight. I asked um, to, to add two more paragraphs that, that aren't on what was handed out to you because I realized that in order to fully understand what Ruskin says about the Earth Veil, vale, we kind of need to have these passages as well. So I'm gonna read um, the first two paragraphs of this chapter on the Earth Veil. Vale. To dress it and to keep it, that then was to be our work. Alas, what work have we set ourselves upon instead? How have we ravaged the garden instead of kept it, feeding, our, our, feeding out war horses with its flowers and splintering its trees into spear shafts? And at the east, a flaming sword. Is its flame quenchless? And are those gates that keep the way indeed passable no more? Or is it not rather that we no more desire to enter? For what can we conceive of that first Eden, which we might not yet win back if we chose? It was a place full of flowers, we say. Well, the flowers are always striving to grow wherever we suffer them, and the fairer, the closer. There may indeed have been a fall of flowers as a fall of man, but assuredly creatures such as we are can now fancy nothing lovelier than roses and lilies, which would grow for us side by side, leaf overlapping leaf, till the earth was white and red with them, if we cared to have it so. And paradise was full of pleasant shades and fruitful avenues. Well, what hinders us from covering as much of the world as we like with pleasant shade and pure blossom and goodly fruit? Who forbids its valleys to be covered over with corn till they laugh and sing? Who prevents its dark forests, ghostly and uninhabitable, from being changed into infinite orchards, wreathing the hills with frail florided snow, far away to the half-lighted horizon of April, and flushing the face of all the autumnal earth with glow of clustered food? But paradise was a place of peace, we say, and all the animals were gentle servants to us. Well, the world would yet be a place of peace if we were all peacemakers, and gentle service should we have of its creatures if we gave them gentle mastery. But so long as we make sport of slaying bird and beast, so long as we choose to contend rather with our fellows than with our faults, and make battlefield of our meadows instead of pasture, so long truly the flaming sword will still turn every way, and the gates of Eden remain barred close enough till we have sheathed the sharper flame of our own passions and broken down the closer gates of our own hearts. I have been led to see and feel this more and more as I considered the service which the flowers and the trees, which man was at first appointed to keep, were intended to render to him in return for his care, and the services they still render to him as far as he allows their influence or fulfills his own task towards them. For what infinite wonderfulness there is in this vegetation, considered as it is, as the means by which the earth becomes companion of man, his friend and his teacher, in the conditions which we have traced in its rocks, there could only be seen preparation for his existence, the characters which enable him to live on it safely and to work with it easily. In all these, it has been inanimate, inanimate and passive. But vegetation is to it as an imperfect soul given to meet the soul of man. The earth in its depths must remain dead and cold, incapable except of slow crystalline change. But at its surface, which human beings look upon and deal with, it ministers to them through a veil of strange intermediate being, which breathes but has no voice, moves but cannot leave its appointed place, passes through life without consciousness, to death without bitterness, wears the beauty of youth without its passion, 
and declines to the weakness of age without its regret. And I especially wanted us to have that passage about that veil of strange intermediate being, which is so important to this concept of the earth veil. Um, and this idea of the earth as you know, a living organism and of our responsibility to it and the responsibility that we owe to it, which I think comes across in those passages. We talked a little bit in the last session, you know, about the idea Ruskin has that you know things are not either wholly alive, you know, wholly alive or wholly dead. They are more or less alive, um, and I love that question, that um, quote from Ruskin. Um, and I, in this this section on the Earth veil, vale, he really is talking, as I said, about our responsibility to the Earth, but also about this sense of of life. And we talked um, in the last session. Um, about that idea of life as being so important to Ruskin and cooperation, cooperating as communities to support life. Um, and I think that this particular chapter has meant a lot to me writing about Ruskin and environment. Um, that article that, Rus that Gabriel mentioned, I also gave a talk about that at Brantwood about the earth fail. Uh, I really like the fact that, you know, we can foreground Ruskin today as someone who was thinking progressively about environment, you know, even though he wouldn't have used that term. Um, the, the word environment was not used in the way that we use it now in, in, during his time. E the word ecology and ecological came into use, you know, during his, the end of his lifetime and in the early 20th century. Um, but more and more scholars are doing work on Ruskin and environment. Um, Mark Frost, who's a member of the Guild and a good friend of mine, is also doing important work on Ruskin and environment. There's been, um, you know, more talks given, some volumes that have been with collected essays about Ruskin. And so I think, um, you know, to make people more aware of his own awareness, you know, at a time before our own, we, as I said in, the, in my introduction, we can learn from him. I know this reading wasn't posted, so I don't know if anyone has any comments on it because you probably didn't get a chance to see it ahead of time. Um, I'd like to say uh, that there's a, an Indian teacher uh, who's, uh, goes by the name Sad Guru, S-A-D-H Guru. I may have mentioned him in the past, in passing. And he has a movement which he uh, summarizes by saying that we are soil. We are soil. We are all soil. Everything is soil. We need to protect mm -hmm. without soil. We, we There's no life. And it, I, I recommend him highly. He, except for some quirky Hindu rituals and you know drink a glass of ash gourd juice a day well we don't have <laughs> ash gourd juice and watering the lingam and the yoni i mean these rituals are not our rituals necessarily but his uh 99 of what he comes up with in the on the internet uh, is extraordinary he's the most enlightened person i've ever heard uh, in this regard and uh, I, I must say you know he, he's not he's he, he's kind of a for example, in an interview, do you get angry, Guru? He says, well, no, I, of course I get angry, but I don't give anyone the privilege of making me angry. <sighs> example of his wisdom, you know. Anyway, right. soil, we are soil. And that's Ruskin. The other thing I wanted to say is that Gabe was very kind to send me an article written by Eugene McCarrah, a Ruskin lecturer, uh, in which he compares the Fran Pope Francis's Laudato Si and Ruskin and finds Francis going so far and only so far and Ruskin going beyond him a little mm -hmm. to, uh, sort of, you know, and, and to, to indict capitalism, which, which Francis doesn't quite do. And well, he means to, I think, but I don't think he quite can. Anyway, this was a, a wonderful introduction to our evening. Thank you. Yeah, I haven't had a chance to read that article yet, but I also received that from Gabriel, so I'm looking forward to reading that. <laughs> So it also strikes me that with the earth veil notion, I'm just struck by how much uh, this, this was in the, literally in the air in that period. You think of Hopkins, mm -hmm. wonderful poem, The Virgin Mary, compared to the air we breathe, in which Hopkins yes. makes that connection between the, the health of nature and what we were, the life that in a certain sense we were meant to have that we are in the process of, of not destroy. only destroying, but destroying. Right. Well, and, and Hopkins also had, had read Ruskin. 
you know, yeah. and in many ways is, is drawing on Ruskin. I mean, it, they're his own thoughts too, but he does mm -hmm. draw from Ruskin too. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, there's a passage in uh, another work of Ruskin's in which he writes, you know, about the fact that man where he, wherever he goes destroys all beauty. You know, and he says that this is this is what happens as a result of, of capitalism and consumerism and so-called progress. Um, you know, we cover the land with railroads. You know, we build ugly villas. <laughs> um, you know, we, we we destroy forests. We pollute. You know, the, the water. There's that great passage in um, a series of letters to the lab workmen and laborers of Great Britain, mm -hmm. Forest Clavigera, um, where he goes back to the towns and villages that he loved as a child. He goes to Kirby Lonsdale and some other villages, and he describes what he finds there. Um, and he finds polluted streams and he finds trash and he finds, you know, human waste on the road and he's appalled by what he sees. Um, and he really indicts, you know, the people who live there, but, but England more broadly, um, you know, for not respecting the land and not understanding the connection that we have to it. Um, and those passages from Fors, in fact, I would love at some point to do a reading group on Fors, which is my favorite Ruskin text. Um, but those passages in particular, I've taught to my students before as well. And most of my students are familiar with Ruskin before I give them something to read from him. And, you know, they read that and they'll, someone always says to me, I can't believe that someone was talking about this so long ago, you know, in these terms um, and with such passion. And they're really surprised to find out that these issues, which, you know, are not new, <laughs> uh, that they all have their roots in a lot of them, you know, roots in the industrial uh, revolution. So even earlier in the Ruskin, but certainly, you know, they were um, accelerating during the time that he was alive. And he wasn't the only one to see this. I mean, there were other people who, who raised the alarm, um, but he did write extensively about it um, and, and with a great passion and with anger. And he founds the Guild of St. George uh, because he wants to, to preserve some land I love the way he's he turns a bit to, uh, on sorry, country and city. I love the way he turns the tables on country and city. Mm. The city is yes. ostensibly urbane and sophisticated, mm -hmm. but no, it isn't. It's the source. It's a, it's a den of corruption and decay. Where the country is uh, was formerly, he he takes issue with the idea that the country pumpkin exists. No, no, no. It's uh, the country is is the sophisticated place to be where the air is fresh and nature is still whole. The wholesomeness of the country really is uh, the pr primary for him. Yeah, and, and on the one hand, I mean, I, I like that comparison that he makes, you know, between the wholesomeness of the country. On the other hand, um, you know, I don't think we should romanticize the country too much um, because life was hard in the country for a lot of people, um, you know, not if you, you had the wealth to live in it, but there were still a lot of people living very hard lives in the country. So I wonder if um, you have to be careful not to romanticize it, it the, the country life too much. And not only that, but the 21st century is very possible to live an extremely comfortable life in the country. Yeah. <laughs> remote remote uh, telecommuting. Tele right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And that kind of life in the country, again, is very different you know, from the life of someone who really is, you know, living on a, trying to make a, a farm work or something, you know, or living in Appalachia somewhere. That's very different than having the money to, you know, build your um, farmhouse out in the country right. and live in it. Yeah. I think too, uh, sorry, with, with um, that Ruskin, of course, is reflecting a, a period of time in which there's a, there's a certain kind of organic life uh, that still exists, although <laughs> even in Ruskin's time, it's being ravaged by yeah. industrialism and by the move to the city and by the move of the city to the country. Right. But, you know, Ruskin's, I think Ruskin's complaint about, uh, there are a couple of places where he complains about urban dwellers who come to inhabit the stately homes of England mm -hmm. and they bring urban values, not rural yeah. values. Not rural them. values, yes. And they break the covenantal relationship between the grandee and his tenant farmers and mm -hmm. the generations of people who have worked this land in, in effect together. Right. Uh, so uh, I think, so I think uh, in any case, I think Ruskin thinks that, that uh, even the poorer people in the country have a kind of connection, natural, organic 
connection with reality and with nature uh, that that is being uh, completely lost in the in the urban environment. Yeah. Well, and I think too here, I keep thinking of Wendell Berry, and I've, I've yeah. you know, written about Wendell Berry before too. And you know, he's someone who's you know living today, and so he's mm -hmm. he's quite old now, but you know, still still writing. And through his career, you know, he has defended um, country dwellers, you know, and and family farms, and he's spoken out against you know strip coal mining in Kentucky, which is where he lives. Um, he's really looked at the way that um, capitalist mm -hmm. society has ravaged the country and the communities. Um, that are established there, you know, and, you know, you have strip mining that comes in and ruins these communities and makes it an environmental disaster and then leaves um, when, once they're done extracting resources. Um, so this idea, you know, of nature as a resource, you know, that, that can be extracted and, and used for profit is something that is, that exists in Ruskin's day that, you know, he's, he's taking issue with and has only gotten worse, you know, in ours. And I, you know, I've said about Wendell Berry before, he wouldn't call himself a Ruskinian necessarily, though he has read Ruskin and admires him. He wouldn't say he was a Ruskinian and yet his work channels so many of the same values as Ruskin expresses so many of those same values. Mm -hmm. I kind of think of him as a modern Ruskin, even though you know, he probably wouldn't call himself that, but they do share so much in common as far as their um, the strong feelings they have about so many of these issues. Yeah. I remember the talk you gave a number of years ago at USC when we did the Wendell Berry Symposium, mm -hmm. where you you put up on the board uh, alternating quotes from Ruskin yeah. and Wendell Berry, and they were finally, uh, you know, indistinguishable, really. Yeah, so very similar. It was really striking yeah. when I was putting that together, going through, mm -hmm. and because, I mean, I, I'd be reading Wendell Berry, and I'm always marking up my, you know, I'd be marking something and saying, you know, compare Ruskin, compare Ruskin, and there's just so many um, intersecting um, passages there and ideas. Yeah, I sent him a copy of that talk and he was kind enough to write back, which okay. is very nice, yeah. Yeah, I think it's interesting, the Wendell Berry connection, because I, I think that I I took this reading too in a, a political realm of kind of the, the the politics today, right? Of this kind of urban versus rural right. sense of values and, and uh, you know, how those get switched now. and. Mm -hmm. People from people from the urban areas think that the rural people are, you know, backwards and simple, and the people from the right. rural areas thinking that the urban people are, you know, corrupt. incompetent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> incompetent. Don't know how to look after themselves. Don't know how to do anything yeah. practical. Yeah. <laughs> and I think Wendell Berry, you know, uh, delves into that quite a bit with his mm -hmm. his writing, and and uh, you know, I, I, that's what I was getting out of this too, out of Ruskin's. Um, at the very the very last kind of sentence, kind of deals, you know brings that out as well. Mm -hmm. Sarah, do you want to move on or do you want to? Yeah, why don't we move on to the next because we're just going to expand on this Earth Veil chapter anyway, yeah. so we can move on to the next. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And in this mystery of intermediate being entirely subordinate to us, with which we can deal as we choose, having just the greater power as we have the less responsibility for our treatment of the unsuffering creature, most of the pleasures which we need from the external world are gathered, and most of the lessons we need are written. All kinds of precious grace and teaching being united in this link between the earth and man. Wonderful in universal adaptation to his need, desire, and discipline. God's daily preparation of the earth for him with beautiful means of life. First, a carpet to make it soft for him, then a colored fantasy of embroidery thereon, then tall spreading of foliage to shade him from sun heat and shade also for fallen rain, and shade also the fallen rain, that it may not dry quickly back into the clouds, but stay to nourish the springs among the moths. Stout wood to bear this leafage, easily to be cut, yet tough and light to make houses for him, or instruments, lance shaft or plow handle, according to his temper, useless it had been if harder, useless if less fibrous, useless if less elastic. 
Winter comes and the shade of leafage falls away to let the sun warm the earth. The strong boughs remain, breaking the strength of winter winds. The seed, which are to, pro to prolong the race, innumerable according to the need, are made beautiful and palatable, varied into infinitude of appeal to the fancy of man or provision for his service. Cold juice or glowing spice or balm or incense, softening oil, preserving resin, medicine of styptic, feb febrifuge or lulling charm, and all these presented in forms of endless change. Fantastic, fantastic. I said earlier, uh, Gabriel, just uh, uh, to, to, to change a, a quip that we've heard, uh, an old saw that variety is the spice of life. Indeed, it, for, for Ruskin, it is the essence, is it not? Mm. Yeah, and the line that always stands out to me from that passage that Gabriel just read is that line about the link between earth and man. And again, coming back to the idea that um, this link is it's essential and elemental and exists and that it's, you know, it, we ignore that at our peril. Well, how do you like the way it begins? And in this mystery of mm -hmm. the medium, intermediate being, what is he saying? I mean, that is a pretty audacious challenge uh, to our intellect, is it not? Um, mm -hmm. What is he saying? Where are we? Well, that's, you know, he's referring back to that veil of strange intermediate being which breathes but has no vi voice, moves but cannot leave its appointed place and passes through life without consciousness. That, that passage that I read before, um, you know, this idea of the earth is, is more than just a repository of resources, you know, but a living thing and to which we are connected. Um, but, but I think he also means that we in our corporeal, in our, in our corporeal, manifestation are a mystery of intermediate being mm -hmm. that there is a higher a different yes. level of being and a prior lower level of being and that we are somehow intermediate mm -hmm. yeah, i think you're right uh you know sarah what was what was funny was when you were sharing about how you would hear um some of your students or people thinking oh gosh i didn't know people thought like this yeah. And I'm, I definitely fit in that category. The first time mm -hmm. I had read Rusk, I went, man, yeah. this is, this is, this is some good stuff. And I remember once, um, this was a little while ago, I had a, uh, met a vendor somewhere and asked for a business card. And mm -hmm. nowadays, I guess the expression is, is, uh, being friends of the environment. Okay. No, we don't, we're not passing up business. We're friends of the environment. Mm -hmm. um under under understanding what i understood was was that they, they're not using paper and right. i thought to myself and this is not a rebuke against this individual or anything like that but how it's very common nowadays to consider being one with nature as being disconnected as humanly possible and it mm -hmm. being kind of the same thing i'm going to step away from using nature Right. And oh, that's, that's, it's, and that's and that's my way of saving it and, and having mm -hmm. no relationship with nature. All the right. Uh, well, and I think one of the sad things that has happened, too, is that we've come to see nature as only in peril. You know, nature is mm -hmm. under threat. Nature is in peril. It's either only in peril and it's dying and things are disastrous or it's dangerous and predatory in the storms that come in. It's going to harm us in some way. Um, and that's not untrue. I mean, you know, we do have more intense storms, you know, the, things are getting, you know, more intense in, in, in the environment and in, in weather. But I think because of that, and the emphasis being on the disastrous aspect of the environment, you know, we're, we're losing even more this elemental connection uh, that Ruskin's talking about, this link between earth and man. It's not necessarily that we look at nature anymore as our ally. We look at it as something either to be saved or something to save ourselves from. <laughs> Um, and we lose something in doing that. And, you know, I worry sometimes about young people because obviously we want to teach young people about the danger to the environment so that, you know, they can become, in, you know, in engaged and care about saving the environment. But if we're only teaching about disaster, I don't think that forges the kind of connection that we need. I mean, Wendell Berry says, you save the things you love. Um, so, we have to first love nature in order to want to save it, not be terrified of it 
or only be pitying it? And I'm not, I'm not sure what the answer to that is, how we strike that balance, but I do worry about that. I handed a young person a, a business card, Joseph, and my re the response I got was, oh, no, 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 I'm a millennial. And she immediately pulled out her phone and took a picture of me. <laughs> I'm a millennial. <laughs> No, no, no. And on that note, I'm going to mute myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, it's again. It was it was it's just quite shocking how nowadays I see. Um, no, I mean I'm 29, so I could I could I think I could speak for my my uh, mm -hmm. my generation. I I see this this idea of of saving nature as disconnecting from it, yeah. and then and in a way, then we don't know nature. Mm -hmm. We have no idea what it means to make something, to right. use yeah. resources. Mm -hmm. If we need something, we go to the store and it's just there. Magically. Magically. <laughs> oh my goodness. It's, it's, it's in stock, you know, right, right. Uh, not knowing what it means. Uh, and I'm, I'm speaking for myself as well. Uh, oh, so am I. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah not, not, not knowing what it means to actually have a relationship with something I'm declaring love for. It's such an interesting concept. I appreciate that. I'm going to think about that today. As as nail, as Ruskin always just tends to nail me, yeah. <laughs> Every time I read Ruskin, I'm like he man, he, he, yeah. All right, spot on. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, I had a student write once at the end of the term. I always have them, you know, do a self evaluation and you know, say some things about the class. And you know, I like to know what they got out of it, what they felt was a strength, what they felt was a weakness, because it helps me tweak my classes and make them better too. And um, they always ask, what was your favorite reading? And one student in, in a semester, he wasn't the only one who ever said he liked Ruskin best, but this particular student said he really enjoyed reading Ruskin. He hadn't known who Ruskin was before. And he seemed like he'd be a really good guy to hang out with yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because of his ideas. He said he was so passionate about his ideas. And I thought, that's great because that kind of, that kind of response to me signals, I don't feel intimidated by this writer. I feel like I'm connecting with him, like he has something to say to me. And I think, you know, as, as people who admire Ruskin and especially, you know, we're doing scholarly work on Ruskin, you always want to find a way to communicate his ideas to make him accessible to people. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, a lot of people tend to think, oh, you know, this is a 19th century writer. He's going to be all buttoned up and serious and, and hard, to, hard to get to know and hard to read. Um, I, I don't think I want to attempt that. But once you start reading Ruskin, I mean, maybe maybe in the beginning, you know, if, if you don't read a lot of 19th century material at first, it might seem, you know, you know, a little bit, um, you know, hard, hard to get at. But the more you read Ruskin, the more you realize that he writes, especially in his later work, in almost a conversational tone. You know, you read the letters of fours and he's writing in the moment, you know, as he's thinking, as things are happening. Um, he's commenting on them. Um, and it becomes a very intimate experience to read um, that kind of, of, of writing. He draws you into that moment and um, and really makes you feel his own his his own passion about the subject he's writing about. And when I see a student connect with him in that way, it's really exciting. And I'm sure Kay has seen this too. I mean, you know, and Braden, you know, you were in Kay's classes, so I mean, Kay's here tonight, and she does a phenomenal job, you know, bridging that gap and bringing Ruskin um, to today's students. And I, you know, I know a lot about the work that she does, so. And I know, okay, you've seen a lot of students react in the same way and really start to see Ruskin as a con almost like, almost feel about him as if he were a contemporary, you know, rather than someone who was writing 150 years ago. Yes. And what's interesting to me too about that is that Ruskin, um, not Ruskin, I think, it's, I think it's Proust who says about Ruskin that Ruskin talks about all the different um, thinkers and writers that he writes about as if they were contemporaries. Yeah, so he can talk about Herodotus as if Herodotus had you just had a coffee with him or something, you know, I mean, um, he just engages with their ideas. And not that he's, under, obviously, he's aware of context and he, he gives context to the people he writes about, um, but he engages with their ideas as though they were contemporary ideas. And, and I think we, you know, when I see someone doing that with Ruskin, it's exciting. I've had a similar experience with the work of Khalil Gibran, who's looked upon from a certain point of view, literary point of view, People look down their noses, you know, as a somewhat purple prose, quote unquote, mm -hmm. Kellogg, Albrand, a satire at Harvard, at the Lampoon, terrible stuff. And I've had to interpret him because he really learned English in 1896-7 in Boston mm -hmm. uh, in, in an Emersonian, you know, uh, uh, environment. 
and it was a bit high flown. Yeah. No question. So, but if you, you boil him down, Ruskin is entirely different. He's not, a, and he's a better prose writer than Gibran was a poet. <laughs> There's no mm -hmm. question about that. But uh, yeah, getting, he, he's so extraordinary. Ruskin is so extraordinary. He's architectonic, you know. One of the difficulties, I think, is that the reach, the the the, the length of his thought, you know, he begins at A, but it doesn't stop at B or C. It's right. like L M N O -N -N -N, because it's so large and so so brilliant. But then, but then again, we usually do come back to A because oh yeah, you know, he yeah he always he ties things together. Um, yeah, and even like the letters of fours, which, you know, there's so many of them and they cover so many different subjects. And in, in Modern Painters 5 too, um, there's, it, it's so broad in the sense that he brings in and encompasses so much. And yet he threads it all together and he shows us the connections. We may not see them at first, um, but he does bring things together. And the third volume of Modern Painters is called Of Many Things, which I love. Um, and it is of many things, but he shows us again, you know, the connections between those many things, between art and politics and society and nature. You know, all of those things are related for him always. If he were solely, if he were solely a scientist, a physicist, he would be looking at unified field theory. <laughs> I mean, he would be the art, he would be the great exponent of it. Mm -hmm. That's basically where he is. He's, he's, he's got a unified theory and we just get, we yeah. grasp it. Hopefully we grasp it and we embrace it, but uh, mm -hmm. it's a bit elusive because it's so big. And I think that can be daunting um, yeah. to people starting out with Ruskin. I mean, 39 you know, volumes in the collected works can seem like how I'll ever get a handle on this guy. <clears throat> um, but I mean, at least I found that once you start reading him, you wanna keep reading more. That's what Ruskin, that's what reading is to Ruskin, right? It's the conversation that you right. have. And for him, it's always a very respectful conversation. If you have, right, the, the book of all, you know, not, not the book of the hour, but the, the book that's worth reading. Mm -hmm. and so when, when you read Ruskin, I, I have to, you know, we teach our students to, to come to him with patience and respect. And, and spirit, like he says in, you know, of his treasuries. No. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, listen to him again. You know, just first a carpet to make it soft for him, then a colored fantasy of embroidery thereon, then tall spreading of foliage to shade him from sun heat and shade also the fallen rain that it may not dry quickly back into the clouds, but stay to nourish the springs among the moss. I mean, that's poetry. Mm -hmm. That's sheer poetry in prose. Extraordinary. Yeah, and Ruskin is always aware of the sound of his sentences oh. too. Oh, the cadence of I the, of, you know. It in his accented voice. Mm. I do wish that. There I are no too. recordings, of course. Yeah, there's recordings of Tennyson and Browning. Yes, and they would Yeah, those wax cylinder recordings. They're not very good, but they're there. It would be yeah. wonderful to have Ruskin's voice, but we don't. My goodness. Maybe a, uh, someone could put it together, you know, as they've, they've extrapolated uh, the sound of Greek music, ancient Greek music. Maybe one could extrapolate uh, from other speakers that have been recorded. I don't know. Project. Do you want to move to the next reading, Gabriel? Sure. Um, this is, uh, did I you, don't think did you want Jim to do is, it. Or? Uh, no, Jim's not here. Uh, Braden, are you? Uh, would you be willing to read this next section for us? I don't think we're getting a response. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm. I'm happy to read again if there's no one else who sure. wants to. But if someone yeah. else wants to, then please, please just let I'll me know. Read. Okay. Okay, you'll read. Okay. Great. I'm reading the, the colored part here. I'm sorry. Yes, the shaded part. Right. Okay, let me get close enough to see it. Composition may be best defined as the help of everything in the picture by everything else. I wish the reader to dwell a little on this word help. It is a grave one. In substance, which we call inanimate, as of clouds or stones, 
their atoms may cohere to each other or consist with each other, but they do not help each other. The removal of one part does not injure the rest. But in a plant, the taking away of any one part does injure the rest, hurt or remove any portion of the sap, bark or pith. The rest is injured. If any part enters into a state in which it no more assists the rest and has thus become helpless, we call it also dead. The power which causes the several portions of the plant to help each other, we call life. Much more is this so in an animal. We may take away the branch of a tree without much harm to it, but not the animal's limb. Thus, intensity of life is also intensity of helpfulness, completeness of depending on each part, on all the rest. The ceasing of this help is what we call corruption, and in proportion to the perfectness of the help is the dreadfulness of the loss. The more intense the life has been, the more terrible is its corruption. And of course, Ruskin takes this and makes an analogy about society as well. You know, all the parts that are necessary to be in connection with each other and help each other. And when you lose that sort of cooperation amongst people and communities, you know, you have corruption or you have loss. And we'll get into the, we're gonna do another reading from this section, you know, you have anarchy. Um, so this idea of, you know, composition, and, you know, he's talking about composition in art too, to begin with, and then composition in, in, in the, the natural world, but this cooperation that we have to have in order for society to thrive, just as we need, you know, that sort of cooperation um, in the natural world. He's always, you know, working outward, you know, to, to larger and broader points here. And I think, you know, just reading this or hearing Kay read this again right now, um, you know, I think about our present political situation uh, and, you know, what, well, what Ruskin might say about it, but also, you know, what we might take from Ruskin and, you know, thinking also about the, how divided our society is and what does happen when we see that, you know, cooperation fails, when this connection fails, when we are no longer, you know, composed, we're no longer helpful to each other. And Ruskin was finding that in his own society at the time, and we certainly are finding it today. And so often, as so often in Ruskin, you know, you read Ruskin, and he's writing about a specific point in time in the 19th century, and yet so much of what he's saying is still um, relevant to, to today and to the things that we're facing. What I find significant, Mark, Mark, uh, Sarah mentioned Mark Frost, who's written very perceptively and at a great length about the law of help. Mm -hmm. A couple of the things that, that Frost points out, which I found persuasive, is that the law of help in a way is the, the central subject, the central principle in Ruskin. It's what draws all of Ruskin mm -hmm. together. You know, his politics, his economics, his natural philosophy, his theology of art, yeah. All of it comes together around this notion of a kind of ecological understanding of reality. Mm -hmm. Frost is a marvelous insight he talks. For, uh, Ruskin didn't only write about ecology, he thought ecologically, which is to say he thought in terms of relationships yes. and yeah. patterns and uh, these, these, these bigger and smaller senses mm -hmm. of, of relationship. Uh, Frost writes, um, composition in painting was a typological representation of the organizational forces that Ruskin perceived everywhere in the wider world. Would it be fair to call Ruskin fractal in his thinking? I think so. 
Do you know what I mean by that? No. Ah, well, the fractal uh, phenomenon is that a, uh, a system uh, in any part reflects the entirety. You can take one atom out of any part of that system and it will be exactly the whole system. It's as if a stem cell, if you will, a, a metaphysical philosophical stem cell that can become anything. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think he's fractal. I think it's fair. Yeah. I feel like I've heard some commentator on Ruskin use that word before, but I can't remember who it was. Yeah. Um, might have been Alan Davis, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Been reinvented here. <laughs> But yeah, as Sarah's pointed out in a couple of things she's she's written, it's you know it's very Platonic. Also, the mm. smallest particle is present in the whole. The whole is composed of all the smaller, uh, lesser elements. It's all, but it's all necessary, and all linked, and all all indispensable. So I think that that's one of the the radical things I think in Ruskin is he wants us to see everything in in relationship. Nature is a web of relationships. It's not mm -hmm. an inert resource to be plundered. It's this web of, of, of linkages uh, mm -hmm. held together by this call of cooperation and unity. And interdependencies too. Yeah. 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 And, and when you brought up relationships, I was thinking of Unto This Last, which also is published in 1860. Um, and you know, in that book, Ruskin looks at economics you know um, political economy through the web of relationships mm -hmm. you know and he argues against a system an economic system in which everything is transactional right. um, and impersonal and he says no you know we need a system in which it's based on relationships in which it's based on you know knowing the people that we're dealing with and caring about them so you know you, you he applies that idea of relationships and interdependencies you know as you said you know to nature to economics to every aspect of what he's teaching in education, too. I mean, you know, he talks about, um, you know, how studies should all be, you know, interwoven. You, know, you shouldn't just learn about things, um, you know, in a vacuum or, or discreetly. You should learn about the way that all these subjects and um, aspects of knowledge interact with each other so that you'll understand them more fully. So with everything, it's a web and everything is always threaded together. And it's all clothed in the majesty of his uh, um formative uh, reading in, in, in the King James Bible, this wondrous shape of sounds that he has imbibed, mm -hmm. it's osmosis with him. I mean, he naturally speaks as if he were writing mm -hmm. another Bible. It's biblically grand. And, uh, and he sort of slips all these extraordinarily clear ideas through uh, the, uh, the forms of uh, seductive beauty that he found in the Bible as he was learning it by heart, you know, under his mother's guidance, so mm -hmm. incredible language used. I, I get really moved by this uh, particular reading because I'm a painter and I, um, I've never really thought of the connection between society and social um, conditions and painting, but how much that colors rely on their complementary and how if your painting's too green, you add that dot of red and it turns mm -hmm. everything correct and mm -hmm. how straights rely on curves and how circles rely on squares and how um, colors rely on their complementary and how light relies on dark. And too often we're quick to discard the dark or discard the piece that we don't care about. And yet that balance between the two is what makes the whole help each other. And I'm, I'm a filmmaker and a storyteller too. And the same exact thing is true in storytelling is that you rely on the uh, villainry and evil to put a, a light on the perceived good and, and you rely on that balance between um, the, you know the light and the dark and the complementaries to um, create a whole picture and tell a whole story and uh, it's it's profound that he writes about this it's it's really meaningful well yeah yeah at one point um, he has a plate of um, a Turner drawing and he's talking about composition and he says, all right, now put your hand over, you know, and he said one aspect of the drawing, put, put your hand over that and see what happens to the rest when you can no longer see that element of the drawing. And now do it with this other element of the drawing and see what happens. And he's trying to make the point that all the different components of this, of this drawing of this composition, and he's talking about art here, um, but they're all necessary um, to create this effect that, that, that the drawing has. 
which is kind of what I think you're talking about. But then, you know, he takes that and, and then again, you know, broadens that out um, to talk about these, these larger, you know, systems, if we will, uh, and connections. You know, all the parts are necessary. He does that, you're know, talking about society and how, you know, all aspects of society, all, all different, you know, classes, all different peoples are all necessary. Um, when he's talking about, you know, education, when he's talking about labor, you know, all, all these, all, all the different jobs, all the different responsibilities, we have to have them all. Um, you know, if everybody wants to climb up the social ladder and be, you know, in, in, the, in the highest class, what happens to, how does society function if, if everyone is trying to get out of, you know, their, their part of society? Um, so he talks about how, you know, at one point he says, even the most servile jobs are necessary. How do we make those jobs um, holy? He uses the word holy um, so that they're not damaging to the people who do them. You know, how do we make all the work of society that's necessary? Um, how do we find people, how do we find people who, to do the jobs, but also make the jobs fulfilling um, so that we don't have situations where people are damaged by the work that they do? Wow. It's kind of a digression from what we're talking about, but he has manages anyone, to, has anyone, go ahead. Has anyone seen any of the, uh, the uh, presentations by a very controversial and rather strange individual a psychologist psychotherapist named Do uh, uh, Jordan Peterson has anybody seen any of those mm -hmm. he's very interesting and yet very controversial very difficult he has sharp edges but he talks about the nobility of the working man of labor and he elevates it and he really punctures the the the, the, the terrible bubbles that a kind of elitist uh, you know uh, liberal uh, mindset uh, has established for us to consider as the, the top of, of our of our ambition. He really does an amazing job, and, and yet he is very difficult. There are times where I just want to, you know, kick him. But he's yeah. yeah I haven't heard. Not, I guess you've you've seen some of his things. I have. He's a walking contradiction because I feel the same yeah. way. He, yeah. He he has some amazing, interesting, important things to say, and then you just want to slap him. Yeah. Um, so it's, yeah. It's and he's thing. so passionate and sincere. He truly yeah, yeah. believes all this stuff, but yeah. I mean, for what for a fellow that's on a pure meat diet, for one thing, <laughs> you have to question <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, I have. I've never listened to him. I'm, I'm. I've only heard. I did listen to a podcast about him debunking a lot of the things he says, oh, yeah. and also holding him up as a pretty dubious figure. So, but I, but I don't know a lot about him. I just it's controversial. He makes some valid points. And he is passionate. It's, you know, talking about the dark and the light, he's the dark, so go to him and it'll be very, I think, interesting. But he, you know, like Carl Jung talks about the, that we all embody the dark and the light, we all yeah. embody the, you know, the child and the maternal and the evil and the, you know, like all those characteristics. And, uh, you know, and I think that's kind of nature and a little bit of what, yeah, what uh, Ruskin's talking about, which is when you sit down to paint a scene or look at a scene or photograph a scene, it's all there and and there's clutter and there's rest and there's chaos and there's beauty and and it takes all those things to help each other to make that composition and make that thing work and i think uh that exists in human beings too where they're a you know a, we're all kind of a clutter of those uh, characteristics uh quite often the uh in uh, the elements of drawing which ruskin published just before modern painters five in 1857, this came out of his drawing lessons at the uh, Working Men's College in London, where he was uh, teaching drawing to, to laborers who were coming there for, in effect, evening, evening classes. And so Ruskin writes there even a little more about the kind of law of health. Uh, this, it also appears in, as Sarah was pointing out, in Fors Clavigera, but um, he writes, composition means literally and simply putting several things together so as to make one thing of them, the nature and goodness of which they all have a share in producing. Thus, a musician composes an air by putting notes together in certain relations. A poet composes a poem by putting thoughts and words in order, and a painter a picture by putting thoughts, forms, and colors in order. In all these cases, observe an intended unity must be the result of composition. It is the essence of composition that everything should be in a determined place, perform an intended part and act in that part 
advantageously for everything that is connected with it. Composition understood in this pure sense is the type in the arts of mankind of the providential government of the world. Hey, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. wow. Okay. Is there more to read here? I think there is, is there not? <clears throat> I think we have two more readings. So we've, no, no we, we have no, one, um, one more. Oh, one, one more? more? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, we didn't finish the de decomposition of a crystal. I don't think we No, yeah. And I will do this last reading. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> a pure or holy state of anything, therefore, is that in which all its parts are helpful or consistent. They may or may not be homogeneous. The highest or organic purities are composed of many elements in an entirely helpful state. The highest and first law of the universe. And the other name of life is therefore help. The other name of death is separation. Government and cooperation are in all things and eternally the laws of life. Anarchy and competition eternally and in all things the laws of death. Were you going to say something, Gabriel? Oh, just that uh, I was going to ask you. It, it seems to me that like this is the purest statement of the law of help that, that, that yeah. we find in modern painters' lives. Yeah, I think it's where he really defines what he means by the yeah. law of help. Yeah, and I think you, you were pointing out that Mark, um, you know, has written that the law of help really underpins all of Ruskin's teaching, and I, I mean, certainly agree with Mark there. Um, it, it does. And I think here, as you said, you know, we get that really distilled statement of what he means by help. Um, and also, you know, we get his protest against competition, which, you know, he found in so many aspects of life in his time and which persists today. Um, when he talks about education, he also, you know, decries competition in education, competition in, in labor, competition in economics. And again, we're back to that idea of, you know, relationships versus mm -hmm. transactional. Um, in exchanges. Did he re know Shakespeare's work well? Yes, very well. I hear in this very paragraph, you know, sleep, death's other self that knits the raveled sleeve of care. Mm -hmm. Death's other self. This here we have the other name of death and so on. Yeah. So many influences. No, he knew Shakespeare very well, and um, he writes about Shakespeare in Fiction Fair and Fall, other places too, but in Fiction Fair and Fall as oh, well. Yes. Oh, I make it yeah, up. yeah. That I don't know. So and in of Queen's Gardens. And yes, of Queen's Gardens as well. That's right. It's so strange to um, consider someone speaking about competition as a negative now, in today's day. I mean, yeah. reading that, going, really? Mm -hmm. Wow, okay. Um, and then reflecting on onto this last, I've, I've only read parts of it, not in its mm -hmm. entirety, but again, moments of, I am so thankful I came across Ruskin, but how somebody was thinking this and I didn't know is, I, yeah. it's incredible, it's really, it's really um, telling. Well, we elevate competition yeah. today. And that's not to say that competition is always bad, but you know, when composition is, composition, <laughs> I'll go back to that, yeah. competition, um, you know, when it's, um, when it's the status quo and it rules everything we do, you know, that is a negative thing um, because it's hard to, to establish those kind of relationships and connections that Ruskin so wants us to establish if we're always in competition with each other. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're not really valuing whatever the thing is that we're competing over, we're valuing getting ahead of the other person. Um, and so it skews our, our values as well. And value is another word, you know, that Ruskin is very careful about defining. You know, for, for Ruskin, value is not, it's not related to monetary profit. A value is something that's inherent. Um, and I think we have a lot of trouble with that today. The idea that something is valuable in and of itself and not for how much, you know, you can get for it on the market. Gone off the rails. Hmm? And think about the, uh, the idea of value is off the rails in American culture and Western culture, generally capitalist culture. And you consider, you know, the incredible prolific number of sports events. I, when I grew up, I mean, I cannot watch a sports event. I cannot listen 
to the commentary. I mean, I know it's a healthy uh, outlet for a lot of people and enjoyable in, in, in many ways, I guess. But my dad used to watch first then baseball and then along came football and then hockey and then, and then uh, um, basketball and all on television and all loud and all outrageous. And it, I'm utterly alienated from it. And I think that our culture is so bound so bound in to competition through both capitalism and, and scholastic achievement because it's a road to, to monetary success, financial success, career success. Mm -hmm. It's a dreadful situation and the sports simply amplifies it, amplifies it. Sadhguru talks about this all the time. Why do you need to be better than someone else? Aren't you, your, your achievement is actually looking at harming as another person. But of course, you know, Anyway, <laughs> I can't go down that road. Well, and I mean, I've given talks before about, you know, the way that the marketplace has, has made its way into education. And I was just talking about this with a colleague of mine at the university the other day. You know, I had listened to a podcast, I'm gonna forget the man's name right now, but um, who's written a book about college today and how, you know, the college, the, the college dream for Americans is really not what it used to be. Um, you know, it's so expensive. You know, often the investment doesn't pay off in the end. Um, but also one aspect of it he raised that I thought was very interesting is he said, you know, there were um, surveys done. I think he said this was in the 40s and 50s, you know, asking young people who were in college, you know, why, why are you going to college? What is it you hope to get out of it? And most of the answers were along the lines of, you know, I, I hope to enhance my life by learning more and gaining more knowledge. You know, I hope to, to deepen my understanding of the world. He said those same surveys, you know, given today, usually return answers that are, I need to get a job. Um, and that's, that's not to in any way to say that jobs aren't important, because obviously people need to work in order to live. And I've talked to my students about this before, too. Um, but that idea, again, of it being a transactional thing, um, you know, where the, the goal at the end is not the thing itself. The goal is, you know, something else to be achieved by that thing, which then sets you up to you know, have a job and become a member of the, you know, as Wendell Berry says, you know, to become like a functionary in this, this capitalist system. A cog in the wheel. A cog in the wheel, yeah. And that speaks more to, you know, Ruskin's definition of value, I think, but. Yeah, and Stuart, you mentioned we didn't read about the composition of the crystal, but if you've read the rest of those those passages, you'll have read it. Um, and I just I wanted to include that because I really love what he does there, um, rhetorically. Yeah. You know, and and leaving us with that. Let me just move to it here. In front of me, it's not on this. One. You know, working through you know the sand and the soot and the mud. Yeah. Um, you know, starting with those. Uh, those materials and then looking at the transformations that they go through and then leaving us with that, the really beautiful passages. And for the ounce of slime, which we had by political economy of competition, we have by political economy of cooperation, a sapphire, an opal and a diamond set in the midst of a star of snow. Fantastic. Yeah, I mean, you just, you have to kind of sit back and say, wow. I mean, there's um, syllogisms, it's syllogism upon syllogism, it's logical. Right. Exposition and it's just extraordinary. I mean, you read like uh, this one about the uh, creating the king's porcelain. May I? Number nine. Mm -hmm. let sure. The, let the clay begin, ridding itself of all foreign substance. It gradually becomes a white earth, already very beautiful and fit, with help of congealing fire to be made into finest porcelain and painted on and be kept in king's palaces. But such artificial consistence is not its best. Leave it still quiet to follow its own instinct of unity, and it becomes not only white, but clear, not only clear, but hard, not only clear and hard, but so set that it can deal with light in a wonderful way and gather out of it the loveliest blue rays only, refusing the rest. We call it then a sapphire. I mean, mm -hmm. it's amazing. Amazing. Incredible. Yeah. On he goes. But yeah, for that's... me, that's, this is one of the most beautiful things about modern painters. Five is 
the um, the whole journey he takes us from uh, the earth veil through uh, his amazing study of leaves, mm -hmm. even to things like leave shadows, and this whole amazing uh, uh, descriptions of how leaves grow and develop. Uh, then he takes us into the whole crystallography uh, aspect, mm -hmm. and then and then atmospheres, and only then does he bring us to the law of health. Yeah. After he's you know sort of created this great symphony of showing us how the interrelatedness of all reality, and then making the application that of course uh, we too need to understand ourselves as part of this this web of of relationships. And this ounce of slime that we are. Yes, and you see how magnificent its own. Read that last. Would you, Gabriel? Again, read that. I just, that, I just adore. Which, that. and for the ounce of slime which we had, by political, the last paragraph, number nine. And here above it, yeah. Oh, that slime. That's, that's yeah. That slime we shall find in most cases composed of clay or brick dust. No, 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 no. no. All the way no. down. All the way down. Let the clay begin? No, and for the, the very last paragraph. And for oh. the ounce of slime. Oh yeah, okay. And for the ounce of slime, which we had by political economy of competition, we have by political economy of cooperation, a sapphire, an opal, and a diamond set in the midst of a star of snow. Good heavens. I mean, mm. If you can't sell Ruskin with that paragraph, forget it. <laughs> right. That's great stuff. Right. Oh my God. You know, in the ethics of the dust, he talks about um, crystallography as well. And one thing he yeah. does there, and in that, you know, it's a dialogue, and he is the teacher, and there's students um, that he fictionalizes, but are based on the students at Winnington Hall, the, the girls' school that he taught at. Um, not in a, in a formal function, but he, he was the, a friend of the school and would go there and he would teach them through Sunday letters and he would visit and give lessons. Um, and in the ethics of the dust, he has the students um, assemble on the playground and he teaches them crystallography by having them move around, um, you know, and, and show the way that crystals would form. And so this is active learning, but it's also cooperation. You know, they have to cooperate while they're doing this lesson. And it's just this very physical experiential lesson that also involves cooperation that teaches them about something in science, but also teaches them about something about community at the same time. And all of this happens in this simple lesson on the playground. And so he finds a way to, to teach these values in, in so many different settings in different ways, but you know, as Gabriel was saying before, it, it underpins everything. I wonder if the anthroposophy schools are, are sort of attuned to Ruskin. I'll bet they are. I don't know enough about them. No. I mean, I know what they are, but I don't know enough about what they, yeah, what they read Ruskin. or think about. All right, look into that. Rudolf Steiner. Oh, I don't know if, if Steiner draws on Ruskin or not. I mean, I think some of the things they do as far as experiential learning and active learning um, seem very Ruskinian, but I don't know as though he's drawing that from Ruskin. Montessori, I would guess. Montessori does. And the Charlotte, Charlotte Mason, um, that method of homeschooling is another one that draws directly on Ruskin. I mean, she lived in the Lake District. She oh. read Ruskin. Um, so that there's a direct connection there, Charlotte Mason method. I actually encountered someone just two days ago who homeschooled her children and used the Charlotte Mason um, program. And she mm -hmm. brought it up to me. Um, she brought it up to me because I had mentioned Ruskin. And she said, well, you know Ruskin, you probably have heard of Charlotte Mason. I said, yes, I have heard of Charlotte Mason. So sometimes, you know, and you don't want to find Ruskin everywhere because that's unrealistic, yeah. but there's, there are so many, you can get in danger of that, of trying to, you know, find Ruskin everywhere. But, but he does, he did affect so many people, um, even if it wasn't directly, you know, sometimes through some other interpretation and or adaptation of his ideas, that he does show up in unexpected places. The man with a hammer and so on. Well, I just had a student mention Tolstoy to me today. Um, and, you know, I immediately go to Tolstoy's, you know, connection with Ruskin and that he read Ruskin and was impressed by Ruskin. 
you know, Stuart Eagles, who some of you know, but who is a, a companion of the Guild and used to be the editor of the Companion, has written, you know, so um, eloquently and 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 knowledgeably on Ruskin and Tolstoy. And so I told the student, I'm going to bring her a pamphlet. <laughs> I said, I have a brochure I want you to read. <laughs> so I'm going to bring her, you know, Stu's book on, on Ruskin and Tolstoy. So these are the, you know, Ruskin, as I said, shows up. So many of his ideas we've now kind of have been absorbed into the into the culture. Not, you know, many of them have not, but some of them have that we don't realize, you know, that that's where it comes from or that's where that connection is. Joseph, can I ask you where you first encountered Ruskin? Uh, here. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was, I think I was asked um, to help. Oh, okay. And through osmosis, you know. Got uh, it. All right. Start hearing things going, who said what now? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> and then go and read it this, and find out well, more. And then, and then uh, Gabriel and I um, went through um, uh, Stones of Venice. Oh, okay. The art, the art of Gothic, mm -hmm. and yeah. we went through it together. And um, it, yeah, it just it was one step after the next. To and I just it was captivated. I did, again, I didn't know somebody thought the way I. I was trying to get these words out at a time mm -hmm. I didn't have the vocabulary, and Ruskin did. Yeah, that's such. I, I've heard that from other people too, and that was a lot of my experience. Also, I remember when I first started, I first encountered Ruskin in college as an undergraduate. And it was excerpts from Stones of Venice and Modern Painters. Mm -hmm. Not the nature of Gothic, though. Um, oh, the nature of I was, Gothic, excuse me. I was, no, that's what, I was interested, but it, not bowled over at that time. But then when I was a graduate student, I, for some reason, I don't remember why I went back to Ruskin and started reading him in greater depth. And I can remember sitting there and I kept writing yes in the margin. Yeah, of yeah exactly. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly yeah. it, you know? Yeah. And, um, and just thinking the same thing that you've just said. Wow, you know, I felt this for a long time, but not been able to articulate it. And here's this person who is articulating it and then going so much further yeah. um, with it, that it was it was really exhilarating. I remember that feeling of exhilaration and just sitting there and, and you know, annotating and taking notes and, and being really excited by it. Yeah. yeah and wishing actually at that time that I had a forum like this in which to talk to other people, which I didn't have at that time, so. Yeah, now very fortunate. Yeah. Is there a plan, um, Gabriel, to do more of these kinds of guided readings with other texts? Um, in, a, in a single word, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> both, uh, I think both on a more informal level, there are a number of us uh, who are talking just about, we're just gonna do it, mm -hmm. um, meet together and on Zoom and uh, have some study sessions. So I'll let people know about those. And then I, I think, uh, we, we made the decision last year after Jim's uh, unto this last sessions were so uh, rich and uh, helpful that we wanna do this at least once a year, but I think we might be uh, considering doing it more often. Okay. Yeah. Because I just think it's, it's really essential for us. Uh, we, we, we talk about a great many things. We talk about applied Ruskin, which mm -hmm. I think is appropriate, uh, looking at modern problems, um, with, with to greater or lesser degree using Ruskin as a, as a uh, source of insight for those modern issues. So I think it's great for us to have to, you know, to, uh, uh, to have a wide range of, of uh, as wide as Ruskin maybe, uh, yeah. of interests and, and subjects and topics that we deal with. But I do think it's also crucial for us to ground ourselves in, in, in Ruskin's own work. In the work, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and because and, and, it's important to talk about the ideas in the work, but also to come to the actual work and experience, yeah. the, you know, the, the language, the sound of the of the sentences and, and really mm. examine it more closely. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and Sheila Emerson makes that great comment that, that Ruskin has many people who write about him, but not many readers. Right. <laughs> Right, yeah, so. and, and, and we definitely want to bring more readers, you know, right. to Ruskin. So that's important, too, because that experience, like like Joseph, what you were saying, the experience of reading Ruskin, um, and like I've heard from so many students, you know, really is, can be so exciting and energizing. Um, one of the things I've always felt reading Ruskin is that he makes you want to go out and do something. 
Um, mm -hmm. It's not a passive experience. I mean, the reading might be passive because you're sitting doing it, but it's not a passive experience in that mm -hmm. he's, at least for me, he's always made me feel like I shouldn't just be reading, I should be doing. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's something that he says, you know, doing is important. You know, he's all about, and he was always doing, whether he was, you know, climbing up a, a ladder in Venice to look at the capital of, of a building or, or, you know, or whether he was, you know, actively, um, you know, founding the Guild of St. George. I mean, he, action was so important to Ruskin. Yeah, I um, actually, when I, before I started my graduate um, program here, uh, I was teaching and tutoring. Mm -hmm. And I've, I mean, I've passed onto this last on to students in business school. Have you? That, Good. Oh, yeah. That word. Yeah. What is this? Mm -hmm. I said, exactly. exactly. You need to read it. All right. Asking, asking these questions they never considered. Mm -hmm. and, and and discussing it in our next session and, and yep. going through it. It was a great, great experience I had with those students. Are you in business school? Is that? No, I'm in a, um, a concurrent master's in philosophy and theology. Okay. All right. Um, I, I wasn't sure. No, and I, I tutored, uh, surprisingly, I tutored the, the student athletes of a oh, okay. university in Miami. And so I'm dealing mm -hmm. with these football players um, getting and. The Florida International University is known for its business school. Okay. So most of them were majoring in business and showing them onto this last, they're going, <laughs> never, never considered these questions. What, who does yeah. profit, you know, to whom does profit belong? Mm -hmm. You know, well, yeah. I, thought it, I thought it was me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> now, now I'm not going to reconsider, you know, so yeah, yeah. some good, good stuff that Ruskin has presented to, to my life and that I've been able to, mm. um, you know, even indirectly present to others. That's great. You know, it makes me think of, you know, one of our um, friends in Ruskin, um, Dyke Benjamin, uh, he runs, he's, he worked in New York in finance, I believe it was. And so Axiom Capital is the firm he worked for. And they run a seminar in which they talk about these Ruskinian ideas. They do readings and they talk about applying Ruskin's ideas to the business world. Um, and I've actually put one of my students who was, uh, he was in a writing class of mine, but he was, he was going to pursue a business degree. And he got really interested in Ruskin in one of my classes, and he was interested in, especially onto this last, and the idea of relationships um, and economics and not and not being just transactional. I put him in touch with Dyke, and I think he sat in on some of those seminars virtually a few times. So it's it's kind of interesting. Um, and Dyke's been doing this for a long time. So you know, people who who work in that in that firm have been exposed to Ruskin in that way. That's it's great. great. Could I make a just uh, present a thought? With, with respect to the way we do these uh, this uh, reading and, and, and conversation uh, informally, um, what would it be like if one of the sessions or at least one part of each session was strictly a reading, kind of a big reading and, and a very dramatic reading of uh, uh, maybe even find an actor who is interested in, in participating so that it would draw more people by virtue of the name of an actor. Uh, I know that uh, Joanna Cassidy, you know, good friend of Don's and ours both, would be more than willing to do that. Uh, uh, Katie Mazur, another friend, actress, would, who has worked for us in the past, her husband as well. I wonder about that. It just feels as if the compression of a reading, so you get Rusk and Hull, and then either then speak together about what you've heard, as well as mm -hmm. having the text on the, play, on, on the screen, or just one event, one week ahead and of reading, mm -hmm. and uh, sort of with a name. And then the next week, a discussion. You may not want to miss either one if you, if they're, mm -hmm. I don't know, what do you think? Didn't the club have someone come in and it was at the birth we of the did. birthday celebration? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we that did. Was, we, had, uh, we had an actor read, um, an excerpted, a condensed version of uh, traffic. The great. Yeah, culture. that's what I thought. Okay. I do think one of my one of my thoughts is that that one of the one of the aspects of Ruskin, such a healthy part of Ruskin's work, it, uh, include all these lectures mm -hmm. that are collected as as books later on in his career. Um, that we miss something if we don't hear them as lectures as talks. Mm -hmm. With the with the kind of diction that that is appropriate to a to a, to a lecture, so I guess that's so not true for what we're concerned yeah. with here, but but uh, certainly for yeah, I to find some sort of a costume mm -hmm. that would be the same 
Ruskin figure showing up every every time. It's something period. It's just something that looks a little period. Oh, I don't know. I'm being theatrical, I guess. Well, Sarah, speaking of, of doing something, I just uh, there's a a, a quote from um, Forrest Clavigera that one of the letters to the working men of England, I think might be interesting to consider as we close out this session. Okay. Uh, this is from letter five. Speaking of the environment and our situation and uh, all of it. Can you share your screen or can you share your screen so we can see the text as well? No. Oh, okay. All right. No. Okay. You can vitiate the air by your manner of life and of death to any extent. You might easily vitiate it so as to bring such a pestilence on the globe as would end all of you. <laughs> on the other hand, there is still time. Your power of purifying the air by dealing properly and swiftly with all substances in corruption, by absolutely forbidding noxious manufactures, and by planting in all soils the trees which cleanse and invigorate earth and atmosphere is literally infinite. You might make every breath you draw food. It is a great passage. I'm glad you I'm glad you chose that one to read, Gabriel. My nephew works at the World Resources International Think Tank in DC uh, as a, he establishes baseline emissions for corporations and travels the world. Uh, expressing them for the WRI. And 12 years ago, he said, we have 10 years. Mm. Just to be realistic. Things are very bad. They are. Um, what I like about that passage too is that it's critical, but it's, it's also hopeful. Mm -hmm. I mean, it offers the possibility of hope. I don't know which is more needed today, hope or righteous indignation, you know, what Greta Thunberg sort of stuff, you know. Mm, probably kind of, both, yeah. A little bit, uh, I don't know. It's, uh, well, in Ruskin, we have both. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm speaking personally. <laughs> uh, uh. Sarah, any final comments you'd like to wrap up this study of Modern painters. I wish it could have been more extensive. It's such it's such a long. I mean, five volumes is a long text. Um, but I'm, I appreciate you all being here. It's been great to be in community and talk about Ruskin, um, and just give people you know who are maybe haven't read Modern Painters a taste of it. I encourage you to to, to read more of it if you liked what you heard here. Um, and I look forward to more of these kind of sessions. I think another thing we can do is choose a, a shorter text, maybe one of the lectures. Mm -hmm. um, you know, where everyone can deal with the whole thing ahead of time and then come together and, and have, a, have a discussion in, the, in that form. And that would be something to look forward to as well, I think. Yeah, great. Yeah. Well, thank you, Sarah, thank for you leading so us in this, in this perusal of modern painters. It's a bit well, like- Thank uh, you for inviting me to do it. The Sistine Chapel in five minutes, but- <laughs> <laughs> A bit, but, a bit. Not everybody can do that and you can. So well, we're, thank we're you. Invited. Thanks. And thanks for those of you who came. I appreciate it. It's good to see you all. Yeah. Thanks, so Joey. Thank and also Katrina for. Um, yes. For, thank you, uh, both of you. With all the tech aspects. Just want to um, just note about our next event. Take a, uh, we're taking a break for the holidays and we'll be back um, first thing next year. Uh, on Saturday, we, uh, we'll, uh, we'll be sending out a notice about this, but Saturday, just so you can look forward to it. Saturday, January 14th at 9 a.m. It's an early call um, because our speaker is the um, UK-based Philip Hoare, who's giving us a lecture on Ruskin and Durer, which should be just amazing. Um, Philip is uh, the uh, professor of creative writing at the University of Southampton. Um, he's uh, the author of um, many other books of history and biography of um, Philip Hoare's Guide to Whales. Uh, mm -hmm. He's also the author of Albert in the Whale, Albert Durer and, uh, and What Art and uh, Art's Insight uh, 
on the uh, natural world. Um, so this should be a fascinating uh, lecture uh, on Ruskin and Poor, uh, Ruskin and Durer by Philip Poor uh, on January the 14th. So we'll look forward to seeing everybody next year. All right. Thank All right. you. Yes, good to see you. Take care.